My name is Iki Trina. I'm Future London Academy's co-founder and welcome to our leadership series. And today our special guest is Tiffany Rolf, an incredible, amazing global chief creative officer at RGA. RGA, I'm sure you know the company, it's a global international company that works in between technology, creativity, media, and all sorts of creative disciplines in one. And uh, Tiffany had an incredible career there, growing teams, uh, creating new amazing campaigns. Um, but before that, Tiffany also done lots of incredible things, including being chief content officer and partner at one of the first agency and consultancy hybrids called Co-Collective. And before that, she also had lots of different leadership roles as well as has been co-founder of her own companies. So Tiffany has seen it all and done so much, including winning lots of awards. And seriously, Tiffany, when I was going through your list of awards, I, I was... Um, not just impressed, I thought, is there anything that you haven't won? Because you've got Titanium Lions and fans, you've got Grand Clio, you've got Best of the Show of One Show. Basically, you've got all the talk of the Best of the Best Awards, which is mind-blowing, seriously mind-blowing. And of course, you've been featured in all sorts of publications from Adage to Advict to Path Company to Wall Street Journal and New York Times, and also been named Women to Watch by Adage. So uh, welcome, 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 Tiffany. How are you doing? Well, thank you. That was quite an intro. And also, wow, I've been doing this for a long time. So yeah, there's there's a lot of things to collect over the years, I guess. Uh, appreciate having me. And I know everyone's all different time zones around the world. So really uh, grateful that everyone's here celebrating, um, going into at least for me, the the holiday. This is like one of my last last things before I get to shut down for a couple of days. So it's fun to, to be here with everybody. Well, I'm also very excited. And it is indeed our, I suppose, last episode of this leadership series before we go on a break. And as you can see from my background, it's quite festive here in London. And uh, I feel like it's a very nice place to finish our and wrap up our series about what the future holds for creative leadership, how can we achieve more in our roles, and basically the best way to prepare ourselves for the new year. A lot of people who reach the chief creative officer position at some point in their creative career were also founders and were running their own companies, studios, organizations. And that made me think uh, that probably those skills are super relevant when you get to the C-level position and suddenly you have to talk to other businesses and other business people. So you kind of have a better context. Am I right? And what would you say you learned from the experience of being a founder that now you realize aha, uh -huh, that was super helpful? I mean, it's interesting because I um I hadn't really ever looked at it through that lens. And I wonder how many um, of, of people in those roles have done that. But I think you're right. Um, for me, at least, I think it was a big part of how I've shaped my um, career. And, you know, part of it is just understanding what brands businesses are going through and the challenges and everything that they have to balance. Um, I think as a, as a leader, you move out of just the lens of like, I'm doing this one project or this piece of work where you can kind of hyper-focus on that. But I think to really, um, to, to be a great partner to clients, you have to understand the things that they're dealing with every day, the, the, the business challenges, all the different facets of, of the business, the different types of teams, the way they have to sell things through in the organization just to get the work that we want to get made out in the world. And when you've had to do that for yourself and understand all these other types of challenges that are coming your way while you're also trying to do great creative work, it makes you, I think, a much more empathetic um, leader, someone that can um, think about creativity in a lot of different ways, because you know, I always believe that creativity is everybody's job. It is how, how you sell through the work, how you consistently solve challenges that come your way, you know, as, as business needs change. And so creativity can really be applied to a lot of areas of business. And that, that business lens, um, I think is something that sometimes is missing from the creative side. Sometimes we're 
uh, sheltered from it or thought of that we don't understand the business side. All, all we think about is this one thing. And I think to become, you know, a leader of an, an organization, you know, at my level, so much of what I'm doing is a lot of different things besides just the the everyday work. But I look at it through that lens of creativity and know that creativity can solve business challenges and can help solve all of these other things. And so um, it has, I think, helped me be a, a leader, a creative, but also a business leader. And I also think it's kept me, um, a lot of the areas that I've done as far as startups, um, founding, I've been trying to do new things, find new ways of working, lean into new technologies that are happening out there. And a lot of that comes with that curiosity, that entrepreneurialism, that wanting to try and do things differently than you've done them before. And that's helped me, I think, also just evolve in my career to where I'm not just trying to sharpen or hone the same skills that I've always had, but like really embrace every new media platform technology that comes our way, cultural challenges, whatever they are. And how do I look at those um, differently? And how do I actually embrace that change? You know, we, we can sometimes be a little bit fearful of change and we want to just keep doing the things we know, but that's to me, the surefire way to kind of have stasis and not evolve and not move forward. I'm all about the change, even though it's a little scary. Actually, that is, um, was my next point of discussion, because that's something that I really, really admire about you. And I was mentioning to you earlier that I was um, watching your old videos, how you were doing portfolio reviews, whatever it was, 15 years ago. And uh, when we had physical portfolios that were like, literally, you remember those when you had yeah. printed out banners frame by frame banner, how about that, to show the animation. What I started thinking about it, that obviously the industry changed so much since that moment, and obviously your career uh, only went up and up. And uh, that's actually very unique for a lot of creative people who get successful. How do you not just stay successful, but also grow and develop and keep up to date with everything that is changing? Because it's so easy to get to this comfortable level where you, well, I'm already very successful, already doing great. I'm in a great company. I, I'm on top of the world. So how not to get stuck at that? And you mentioned being open-minded. But from a very practical way, how do you learn? Where do you get these ideas? How do you make sure that in the next 10 years, you still stay relevant and up to date with everything that is going on? I mean, I, I think there's a, a certain amount of just, you know, being comfortable, being uncomfortable um, and learning, learning new things, being the one to take on the challenge of new a project that maybe you weren't sure you can figure out, but you apply your past skills and try to work with people that, you know, know different things than you. And that can create, I think, some tension at times, but if you embrace it, it does really help you push yourself forward. You mentioned even that thought of up and up. And I think we sometimes think that like moving up is this kind of logical progression and it's a step. And it's like what I know I apply to the next and I just keep building on that. And actually for me, um, going up didn't always mean going up. It meant going sideways, sometimes feeling like you're going down a bit because a lot of the choices that I made in my career weren't maybe the obvious next step up. They were, you know what, I'm going to join this startup that is totally different than what I've been doing. You know, that when I went and did Co coming off of Crispin Porter Bogusky, which had been on this kind of meteoric rise of awards, and we were a little bit of a different place, but um, Co was one where we were doing like consulting a little bit more um, strategic work. And that was really a strange step, I think, coming out of my past job from ECD of running a big creative office. The next logical step was for me to go to like a bigger agency that did that, maybe at a holding company or whatever. And I did this kind of sidestep. In some cases, I, I was a little bit worried, like, is this a mistake? Am I going to be able to get back into this side of the business if I go this way? And actually, I have a lot to learn over here. So I don't feel like I'm going up. I actually feel like I'm kind of going over and off the trail a bit. And um, and I think for me, it was about having faith in the people that I'm learning from. So the, the people that I was joining were people that I knew I could build and learn and grow with once I respected. And also, I would be learning something totally new. And while that would feel like I wasn't moving up, in the end, I think it got me a little bit of a, you know, a jump even higher, I chose a path that allowed me to kind of become a different kind of creative leader, one that was more mature, like to your point, like understood the business side of things, having to really build in that way. 
And even though it was a smaller place, the challenges that I was faced with, I was able to apply in a much bigger place when I came to RGA um, because I was bringing in a lot of these different skill sets all together. And so the, the up and up isn't always that sort of uh, logical progress stepping path. And I think a lot of people are afraid of that to a certain degree, but I've found the ones that have taken those risks and some of those chances to, to really push themselves out of their comfort zones and, and discover new things. Um, it helps them, you know, really differentiate compared to the other people that might just be in a little bit more of that traditional step up path. So glad that you mentioned that uh, kind of journey that is not always up and up and especially that uh, decision making process of choosing your next adventure, not just by how big the company is or how cool the job title sounds, but actually by what will you learn? What kind of yeah. new skills can you acquire? What kind of people will you work with? What are the kind of the projects that you will try doing that maybe will give you a new perspective? I think uh, Adam Grant, one of wonderful psychologists, definitely wrote about this kind of their decision making in terms of the next project that they pick from the learning perspective. So if this project fails or whatever, the new things that I pick up, even if it nothing the main outcome whether it is money fame whatever doesn't doesn't happen what will yeah. I be left with will I be left with good connections or will I be left with learnings of whatever new industry new technology or something new that I can take with me to whatever is next for me and that definitely something that stuck with me and I definitely try to look through this lens saying that in the middle of anything that is that unknown and uh, not as well planned it can feel like you might be doing the wrong thing of like why did I leave that amazing job with great salary to do this or like why am I not sleeping at night because I think this can be something have you ever had those thoughts in the middle of being in on that journey and and I suppose, how did you explain this to yourself? Or what was your thinking process then? You know, we all have questions. Some days are amazing. And I'm like, this was like the best week, the best day, and everything's going great. And other days I question the thing I just said in a meeting and wonder if like the path I chose is right and all that. But um, so far, I have found that like, you know, if you stick with it, um, and again, make it for the, the choices of growth and learning and being around people that, you know, you respect and, and th think you can grow with the outcome for me, at least has, has worked out. Um, because I look around me and go, you know, am I still learning? Am I still growing? And that's the question I guess I'm always asking myself. And I remember I had been at Crispin Porter Bogusky and I stay places a long time. So you would say, wow, she's like, just stays places, but I go, I try to choose places that have that either in them that I know will change alongside that I can affect and help change, or I have to seek out that change. And when I was at Crispin for those 10 years, you know, it started at a hundred as a hundred people. It, it ended up being 1100 people. I moved to three different cities. I had many different roles. So I kept growing and it wasn't until there was one day where I was doing an assignment and I was like, wait a minute, I feel like I've done this assignment for the last, you know, two years again. And now I'm just kind of on step and repeat. And that's, that's the part, that's the thing that always gets me is when I feel like I'm a little bit stopped or stuck. And if you can't make that change around you, which sometimes you can be in environments that do, um, you can make that for yourself. You don't have to quit, leave, go somewhere else to do it. You can try to create the conditions, the role, reshape it within the space that you're at. But if you feel like at some point that you're stuck and you're not growing, that to me is always that signal. So I'm always kind of asking that question of myself. And even if it's hard, you know, and even if it's like that thing didn't work out to your point there, it's not filled with every, every single day as, as, as total success, but even with some of the, the failures or the, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done this thing or that, you know, you can, you can learn from those. And then I also think it's about surrounding yourself and being with people, listening to different perspectives that are different from your own that help you see things differently and help you grow too. Um, where, where that could be a lot of challenge, you know, I think one of the questions uh, I saw a couple of questions come through before, and it was bringing all these different types of skill sets together. Um, and that's a lot like RGA has many different types of skill sets. So we do many different types of work that can be very challenging to have, you know, all of this different ways of thinking together. Um, but to me, that's where, that's where I grow too. Like I, I like to change up, work with different people, not just do traditional partner structures, creative partner structures, 
um, push myself to look at it through different lenses, different backgrounds, even though it can make me uncomfortable. And even sometimes if I, I think my way is right, like you try to take in the other way because it surprises you how just, you know, forcing yourself out of your comfort zone helps you grow. So it's not always easy. It's you, you question it every day, but I think if you're, if you're growing and learning, then I think you're always kind of doing the right thing. This is brilliant. And I love how you talk about being uncomfortable and being challenged in your opinions, because again, what comes with seniority and what comes with success, I suppose, or at least stability in career that you start thinking that you always right because clearly your decision-making process got you to where you are right now. That means you you must know something about the industry, about the job, about the clients, whatever there is. And it becomes very hard at a senior level to drop those thoughts or those patterns that you already have as they led you to where you are. Do you remember any things that uh, made you uncomfortable, things you didn't agree with or a situation where you had to drop one of those beliefs clearly worked for you for a very long time to make sure you actually progress in and do something different? Well, there's probably a couple of different examples, but actually I was going to just give an example of not necessarily, it wasn't a working situation, but I recently did. And you know, everyone coaching is good for everybody. Right. And I've, I've had some different coaching. I went through um, a leadership lab that was part of our holding company recently. And I hadn't done anything to the extent that it was. And um, it was a really interesting exercise because it was all leaders in a room together and we were all asked to bring a challenge. And um, and then we were asked to not try to solve the challenge together, but to take a lens, a different way of looking at each of that challenge. And one of them was like, you had to just look at everyone in the room and under and give and just give perspective on what's happening in the room around you. You had to give a lens of like, what do you think the challenge you have? Take the other side's perspective, you know, and, and be be that perspective. You couldn't also say anything. You had to just have a round of asking questions. And then I had to do one where I just had to write just things I saw in the room and just that forced um, way of having to look at something in a different mode. I think as leaders, sometimes we get in that solve mode. I get on a call and I'm supposed to look at something and in that moment say, yes, no, this, that. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves that, you know, giving an answer isn't always the best way to solve things. It's actually like listening, trying to take on a different perspective, holding back what you want to say. And those are things that I think um, are challenges I'm getting through because to your point, you do this for so long. There are some things you just kind of know, and there's other things that you have to remind yourself that sure, you know, a way to do it, but is that the best way? And what I was so surprised at is that we got to different solutions that I think we would have ever gotten to had we all just jumped to solve it. And based on our, our past experience. And that I think is a consistent challenge as, as we get into leadership roles, because people, so many people want us to make quick decisions and make those decisions. And we as leaders have to sometimes go, actually, I'll help more if I, if I don't just solve it, because I might also not have the best solve. Um, and that, that I think is um, a challenge that I, I consistently probably deal with and, and try to um, remember and, and, and recently, you know, got a little additional coaching to help remind me of that. Uh, this is amazing. And I can so relate to this. I'm very much a problem solving person and it's extra hard for me not to fix something when I see it broken. Um, and there was a, a good uh, saying, sometimes someone needs to be heard rather than fixed. And um, it's a, it, it, it's true sometimes even with friends or family, like someone tells you something and your immediate reaction is like, okay, I know how to fix it. This is what you need to do. And this is yeah. after this, you do this. And sometimes people just want to be heard. They don't want their problem to be solved. They don't want anything else. They just want or they, to be and heard. And they don't, they don't actually learn either. Cause you know, it's it, funny. Someone mentioned to me, I was just talking about this yesterday and they said um, some of it, they called it either fireproofing or firefighting. Although someone said, yeah, but it's way more fun to be a firefighter. So it's not, not always as fun to be a fireproofer, but like, I think as, a, as leaders, we have to sometimes be fireproofers, not firefighters. Um, and I think that that is where, where you learn and how you learn. If anything, I think, and this is where doing some of my own, having to be my own business owner at times, you had to figure things out yourself. You didn't have someone always to solve it. 
And I think some of the best early career, I like adv- guidance and advice I got was not getting any, you know, where you ha- you're just put in a room and you got to figure it out. And so, and that's with kids too. We sometimes, I have children now and I, I want to come in and tell them to do this thing or not do it this way. And, and you learn that you got to let them fall for themselves and bump some heads and, you know, ask the questions and stuff. And th- that's how I think being a good leader is, is, is sometimes letting, letting, guiding people through their own decision-making. And that can be, that can be challenging, but that's part of, um, that's part of leadership. Yeah. That's one of the hard parts, uh, I suppose. And uh, yeah, definitely good to reflect on it and kind of stop some, sometimes our own pre programmed behaviors and question whether it is the right approach in this situation. And I love how you talked about this coaching technique of trying different approaches and looking at people or writing instead of saying, and I definitely think that kind of stretches that muscle of only why way one way of solving a problem uh, so that's something I'll try next time but you mentioned your wonderful family and that was something that um, you proudly put on LinkedIn that your mother and uh, global chief creative officer and I think this is the conversation that is really um, we we have in a professional environment in terms of not just um, the balance but also the fact that you becoming chief creative officer that meant you had to work much harder and you had to be much more effective with your time and you had to think things like much better to to get to the same level because you were also trying to succeed in the other massive part of your life which is family and uh, I would love to hear how have you done this and have you learned anything in terms of how to do it in the most effective way uh, but also from the emotional perspective how What kind of emotions did you have on this journey and how did you deal with those conflicting emotions that all of us as human have when we try to do two things that are very important to our hearts? Well, it's interesting. Um, A lot of people ask about how do you balance it, right? And I say I never balance it. I that that even that metaphor and the visual of like balance where, you know, you have scales that are perfectly aligned and evenly distributed. I mean, if you if that that is the far, furthest from a visual of my life, it's always sort of up and down and sideways and over. And so for me it's it's more just around, you know, boundaries setting some of those things that you're, you're always going to make sacrifices. You know, even today I'm, I'm leaving early because I'm going to uh, play for my kid's school and I'm going to go with her there. And, and you have to just decide what are those things that you are, aren't going to sacrifice. And, and that is a day-to-day decision. I know that I'm not going to be the perfect PTA mom, you know, and always there, but you know what, like I designed the the school yearbook last year and felt pretty good about it, even though I couldn't come to any of the baking sales and the, and the classroom events, you know, so you find your way to contribute um, and you bring what you can bring to the situation and you try to, I think, not beat yourself up about it. Um, my one, I don't, I didn't know many people that were in my situation to look to, to understand, um, part of when I went to start and be a partner at a company, um, the CEO that I, was my partner, she was, um, she had a family and she was like, you know, give yourself a break, Tiffany, <laughs> like at first when I, I had a kid, when I was there and, and you just give, you have to give yourself a break. There's going to be days that you have, you feel like you got it all under control and there's days that you don't, you got to be okay with that. And I also think um, what I've tried to do in my role is show the messiness because I think sometimes I, I never like it when people are like, you ha- somehow have it all and you're, you're a superwoman and you're all this stuff. Cause I'm like, oh no, like if people think that it's all easy. And I somehow I figured it all out. Like I don't have it figured out on most days, you know, like I I'm in a closet hiding from my kids trying to do a zoom call or someone screaming in the background. I mean, I think in many ways the I actually think a big good thing that came out of the pandemic was just the messiness of our lives being exposed, whether you're a, you know, mom, a dad or whatever, and, or just have personal things happening. And I think it's important um, I remember I had um, someone, one of my kids screaming because I had to do a Zoom call from a car and in the background and one of my CDs who was about to have a kid was like, oh my God, I'm so glad that your kid is screaming in the background. So now I know it's okay for my kid to scream in the background. And I think you just have to, you know, um, be okay with that. And then also know that it's going to be hard work. Like I work really hard. Um, I found my way of doing it where 
you know, my, my husband also has a really big job. So we try to help each other out and tag team a bit. We have, um, I have good friends. It a, takes a village that help me out. If sometimes I'm like, can they go with you to school or pick up? You know, you, you need people around you that you trust. And especially if you don't have family around, which I, I don't have, you know, family around in the city. And then you just try to do your best to um, do the best at work, but do your best as, as being a mom. And sometimes those things um, crash into each other. And sometimes it's it's great and it, and it totally works out. And, and I think in the end, um, you know, my kids know, and I think are proud of me and what I do. Um, I try to introduce them. They come in and my, my son brought his snake on a zoom call the other day, which freaked everybody out, but it was kind of fun. <laughs> into a client meeting. And those things I think um, we're getting better about. It's gotten better, I think, to allow the the intersection of our lives to show. And for me, like I found that, you know, after everyone goes to sleep, the kids are down, my, even my husband's like asleep. That's I, There's a moment, an hour or two where I spend at night doing some of my stuff myself. And I try to have, when everyone's together, we have that that family time, do some homework, and I try to shut down, you know, during that moment for work. Some days it doesn't work out, but but often it does. And then I have my times where I figured it out for myself. You know, the, the one thing I do probably consistently is sacrifice my own needs, you know. So sometimes I'm not at the gym as much as I want. My, my roots aren't as good, you know. <laughs> my nails don't look great. But then I get back into the mode of also taking care of yourself because that's that's a big thing. You have to not always leave last on the list. So um, m- one of my new year's resolutions is a little, is, is more time for myself. So we all, we have a lot of things and needs, but we, we also have to, to care for our clients, care for our kids and care for ourselves. I'm glad that you put yourself in the mix of the priorities <laughs> as well, because I think that's everyone's better when I'm not in a bad mood. Let's just say. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Definitely true. Um, and I love that you brought up the, the the hard work behind trying to do both because it, it is an incredible hard work. And uh, the fact that you're sitting here and still doing an interview uh, while there are so many things that you need to do and have to do. And uh, obviously, we totally appreciate it. But also, um, it's incredible that you find time to do these things, but also very strict on I need to leave early as much as I want to contribute to this it's very important for me that I go with my kids wherever I need to go. So I love that you very clear with your boundaries and very open about why you're doing certain things. You didn't say like, I have a next meeting straight after this. So let's cut it short. You were very open about the reasoning behind it. And I think for me, it was very helpful also to understand the context and uh, kind of form a bit a better of a understanding of you as a human, what your life is and what your priorities are, which uh, I think benefits all of us as teams and as companies and societies. So I'm glad there are people like you who are very open and vocal about it, because I think it benefits all of us to have to hear this conversation and also to be part of these conversations. I think it's important, you know, some of the questions were about leadership and new leadership. And I think when I started out, it was just, and it it still is about the work, the work, the work, the work. You hear that always. And, you know, the work is what, you know, you need to do great for clients and all that. But the people, the people, the people is is core. And you, them seeing that you can be a full person and do this role. And actually you can bring that into the work. It makes the work better. You know, me being a mom makes me a better leader. Me understanding real scenarios in life helps me make the work more relevant to people. Um, and so I do think that, you know, focusing on understanding our, the people were around us and not just through the lens of the work is important because you have to create that that culture and the conditions for the work to thrive. And if you don't have that, then you don't get the good work, you know. Totally agree. And I think you also mentioned a very important point that's also for, for your family and for your kids is very also important to, to see that role modeling that you can have a successful career and you're passionate about your work and you really love what you do and you do it with all your heart. So I think that's very inspiring for them to see. But are there situations where you have to hide in the closet, you have to do a certain thing and um, your, your kid wants your attention, they want your love? And you have to have this tough uh, decision saying, sorry, not now. Are there any ways where you found a way not to feel guilty in the moment or certain ways you 
found a way to have this conversation better? I don't know, anything around that moment? I've pr- had a lot of times where kids have come in wanting me to do something. I mean, I usually just either I say, I pause if I can and say, excuse me for a second. And then I I talk to them and say, here's what's happening. Or I have had to be like, no, <laughs> you know, and they, and then afterwards you have to talk to them. You talk them through it. The, the one thing that I, I have, you know, learned around being a mom and having kids is you can just be clear with them. You know, it's like, Hey, sometimes mommy has to be very focused on what she's doing. It's just like when you're in school, you have to be focused on doing schoolwork. If I came in, I sometimes give examples that they can relate to. So I went to, I went to my uh, kid's class a couple of months ago and I waved to her and was like, hi, Myla. And I was like making faces or whatever. And she came to me afterwards and said, please, if you come back again, never yell my name and, and make a face at me in class. It's very embarrassing. <laughs> and so I use those examples. And I remember when I came to your class and you wanted to focus and embarrassed and distracted you. And I yelled your name and like waved and made smiley faces in class to you. And she was like, yes. I'm like, well, sometimes that's how I am with, with my clients. Like I can't, I I have to be very focused and it's a, you know, it's also a little embarrassing for me. And so I think then they get it. They're like, oh, okay. I totally understand that because I've been there. And so sometimes it's just telling them how it is and why, and that you have to be in these situations that don't make sense in that moment, but that, that they're important, you know, because of the the context and, and they get it because they deal with it too. They don't want their parents crashing in on them in their, in their environments as well. Oh, this is such a creative approach to motherhood <laughs> leadership and time management. This is brilliant. Uh, and uh, yeah, definitely. I think it's a brilliant hack to to have uh, adult conversations with with your kids you mentioned team and uh, how important it is to to kind of think about your team in a holistic way and there are lots of questions that people asked about how to grow the team and all sorts of things that can make the team better and i would love to talk a little bit about that specifically with uh, how do you promote people within the team and what kind of qualities do you look for in someone to get them to, let's say, creative director level, executive creative director level, and how do you help them with that transition as well? In my career path, I remember at least one of my leaders or bosses at some point um, telling me that, that you don't get promoted and then do the job, you do the job before you get promoted. And I do think there's a lot of truth to that. It's not to try to get people to do more than they're actually paid for or they're titled at, but what it just signals is that you are already stepping into that role and what it takes and not looking at your role is just like, here's, this is, I'm sliced out in this way and this is all that I do and this is what my job description is. But when you start to, I think, um, be accountable for more, when you look around you and go, okay, I'm going to, my, my role can actually bleed a little bit into this role and that, and I can help support um, and fully kind of guide the team and look at it through a wider lens. I think that's a signal that these are people that are growing into, um, into the next phase of that leadership. I do think to the point earlier that we talked about, it's important for people to have the opportunity to do that too. Also, you know, to not just be going, hey, you can't do this. You only have to do that. I'm going to come in and, you know, and and let them make mistakes even. I think we sometimes, it can be a lot of pressure on all of us to deliver for clients. It's more competitive, I feel like, than ever. Everything feels like it's a pitch in a way. And it can be even harder, I think, to allow people to make mistakes um, and so where are those moments and those opportunities for them to have that ability to try on their own, to make decisions and choices on their own? And that's um, a job that that as a leader, whatever level you're leading kind of below you, that you allow for some of that to happen, even if it means you might have a bad meeting, even if it means, you know, you show up not as well as you would like to. Um, but I think some of those learnings are really important to kind of learn for yourself and figure it out. So that I think is really critical. I think the ones I I always tend to favor when you're just getting, you're, you're building with the team, getting the work done, you just are thriving and, and continuing to be part of the team 
um, rather than it's always a conversation about when am I getting promoted? When am I getting this? When am I, there's a, there's a lot of urgency around that. And it's not that everyone shouldn't get promoted, but I feel like sometimes those become the conversations then really about what are we trying to get out of it? What is it about that role? Cause I, I worry sometimes if you get promoted too quickly, that you don't actually thrive then in that next level, you aren't getting all of the different skills and stuff that you need. And so I think that's where on both sides, we can all do a little bit better management on how to give people those opportunities to grow. And also how do you allow yourself to grow and then be ready for that next step uh, simultaneously. So that way you are in the right role and position and doing, doing the actual job once you're there. This is uh, great that um, you talk about this from like perspective of doing the role before um, actually getting the job title and especially actually enjoying that as well. Because I think a lot of the times people get promoted to the role that they think they will like, but turns out when they start doing it, it's actually something that they never wanted. So I think it's very important to have that taste of a role before you actually step in into that fully to understand if that's something you actually enjoy doing. And in our conversation earlier, you also mentioned that uh, one thing that you wished you knew uh, before you became chief creative officer is actually to, to enjoy each step of the process a bit more in terms of your progression and not being too focused and again, going to the next, next, next and uh, enjoying when you still learning about design and creativity and kind of all the experiments and the failures that goes with it and the first it's time like enjoying school you know like I sometimes wish I had even done more in school even if it meant like worse grades because I was just just to soak it up take all those opportunities when you can be learning to just learn them because there's some of the things that I I'm in the role now one it doesn't ever get easier it's just different in some cases it gets harder and you still do the things I still sometimes like have to help write like a social post that's like going lot, you know, we we're all also still doing these other jobs, even no matter how high of a job you get. And if you don't enjoy every step of the way, it, it, it's not like all of a sudden at some point things get easier and you can sit back. You're always challenged. Right. And you have to kind of embrace each of those levels and try to enjoy what you get out of each of them because you miss some of that stuff. I miss some of the things that I don't get, you know, in the, that in what, what I do now. And a lot of the operation stuff that I do now, like there's some things that, um, that when you first start out that you don't get to do as much of and, and they're fun, you know? And so try to just really live in that moment a bit. And I feel like the, the rewards and the levels and all the things can come along. It doesn't mean you can't advocate for yourself and, and all of that, but it's about just trying to actually, soak it all in. And again, if, you know, if you're not enjoying it, that it doesn't mean you're going to enjoy it when you get a little bit more senior, you have to find the things in it that you want to do and enjoy doing. I think every part of life more, even roles, where there's roles, we always look back and think if only we just relax a little more in that moment, instead of trying to begin, get the next thing, next thing. It's like before preparing, get an offer for a birthday or for a big event, you kind of so excited about the next thing. And then it goes like this and you're like, ah, I didn't actually enjoy the moment and being present within whatever there is, uh, excitement before or when it happens or the feelings after. I think it's a hard skill for any human to learn. Um, but uh, yeah, we, I think that's definitely something that would be super helpful. And yeah, something we should, um, yeah, should, should do more of. In the meantime, um, we will discuss a few more questions that I would love to talk about today. And you already started talking about the team and uh, kind of how important it is to have the great team. And part of it is hiring as well. And uh, especially hiring for senior roles, I think, becomes kind of more and more challenging again the, the further up you go the more senior people you need to hire and I think at the designer level and even at the creative director level I suppose you still look at the portfolio mainly and kind of the quality of work but the more senior people you hire the more you have to consider other skills so could you tell a bit more about um, what do you look for in for, for senior people, whether it is executive creative director level or whatever senior creative roles you hire for? And yeah, how do you make decisions about hiring someone or not hiring someone at that uh, level? At the higher levels, um, and again, I think it depends on where you are, the place you're at. You know, you you have to also hire for the culture and the skill sets and everything that kind of come along with the place. Um, and RGA 
is is a unique place in that you know we don't just focus on one kind of work. You know, we have um, more of the comms kind of connected communications, more digital first communications. We have product and experience kind of design work. We have brand design and consulting. We have media. Because of that, we have we need people that also know how to be connectors across those, those different types of work. Um, have to be both experts, but but very T shaped in terms of their experiences. And I've at least found for for our environment at that leadership level, they they tend to be people with similar paths that I've had, where they've decided to not just take that traditional one type of pathway, you know, one type of agency journey. They've gone client side of it. They went to a tech company. They were at a more traditional ad agency. Then they did some design. And there's something about their appetite for taking their creativity beyond one or two formats, you know, mediums um, is something that is a, is an important type of leadership skill set that I think um, has worked well at RGA. That's not to say we we don't also have experts that just do one thing really well because we need those too. But especially at that highest level leadership, a lot of our projects need to intersect with other types of work, different types of teams. And if you only know one way of working, have one kind of background, have only worked in one type of culture that's a little bit more singular, they have a more of a challenging time, I think, um, helping to bring teams together, different kinds of teams together, and and bringing um, an openness to different ways of working. So that that's something that I look for at RGA and leaders um, as well. And that's been a big how do, you, how do you test this, like all of these things? Because they, I suppose, easier described than actually observed when someone comes for the interview and you have very limited amount of time and... How do you test for this culture, for this kind of different skills that you're looking for, especially when they're not visual, like a portfolio that you can just easily look at? Well, a lot of times when you're at that level, it's the places that you've been, you know, the choices you made, hearing about that journey. I, you know, I talk a lot to people about their experience. I love hearing kind of like, how did you start out and how did you get to where you're at? And they, and hearing about those different journeys that they've gone on. Usually at that level, they, they have a a portfolio of work that you can kind of nod to or look to. Um, And, and at least for the the people that I've been interested in, it's been, you know, ones that have, have had that journey. And also we are more of a, a technology minded creative place. So Rather than um, I only want to do film or I only want to do this one type of thing, how can I express my creativity in all new ways? And I'm okay learning new tools and, you know, figuring out new ways of working. And so that openness um, is is important for at least the, the leaders I look at coming to RGA. And that might be really different than if you're going to a different kind of place that is really focused on one one type of, of work. But But that's been at least um, a lot of what I've looked for as I've found the leaders that I have at RGA. That's actually a good point about openness and specifically openness to learning new, because as as we just discussed earlier, I think the the further you get in your career, the more senior you become, you kind of sometimes can get stuck in your own way of thinking. So looking for leaders who are still open minded and who are still willing to learn and don't think they're right all the times um, and also want to stay up to date with how the industry is changing. I think it is crucially important. So um, if you yourself are that type of leader in your organization values that type of thinking, then definitely attracting people who still want to learn and stretch their thinking and will question things and look at things from a different perspective and won't think their opinion is the best. I think uh, that's something that I think more of us should look uh, for in the people that we hire. Yeah. And, um, and just to add to that, like, even when I first started out, like it was important for me to have, to show that I did lots of different types of work and my portfolio was a blend. And so I remember I knew that not every place would like that. A lot of people told me, People just want to see ads, this kind of print ad. They want to have 12 of them, three campaigns or four campaigns, three each. There was like a formula. And I was like, well, why? And I I remember I had, you know, some, I was a website designer then like early days. I had a book that I had made. I printed some clothing and um, I wanted to find a place that kind of matched with that. And and beyond um, still at RGA, it's, we have a lot of people that also have been at places for a long time and they 
they want to come and use our RGA as an opportunity to do something new. For me, I want to already have proof that they've done that along their journey rather than at the end of towards the end of a career going, oh no, I have to. Cause I think that's another point you can get to where you don't try that soon enough. And then before you know it, you have no choice but to jump out into something new. And it's much harder, I think, if you haven't kind of embraced some of that um, earlier on. Uh, in your opinion, Tiffany, what is the hardest part about being a creative leader? Is it hiring? Is it creating the right culture, time management, working with uh, other C-level team, CEO, CFO, CEO? Is it day-to-day management? Not doing enough creative work, looking after the business side or letting people go? What is one hardest, if you had to pick one? I'll just bring the letting people go as one that's especially hard. But I also think that I always say to people, you're not a leader until you've had to fire somebody or let somebody go because it is part of what we have to do as in this role. And a lot of times it isn't because they're not great. It's a business decision. And that to me never gets easier. So that one I think is a hard one, no matter what. And that's something that really truly is a a leadership role and job. Do you remember the first time you had to let someone go? And I cried and they cried probably. Um, and, but then you learn after you've been here for a while, it's sometimes people then go and they do more and better. And it was the right thing. And I've had people that I've had to let go for business reasons and I, we've come and worked together again. So, you know, it, it's part of uh, a journey and part of the job, um, but it isn't the end of things. Yeah, actually, that's good to remember that uh, it's not death. <laughs> it's uh, still your career goes on. And uh, um, I totally agree that sometimes it's like a breakup. Uh, sometimes uh, it was the right time and both people find better path for themselves and uh, actually thrive in new environments. So um, sometimes it's just a, a new adventure that starts after that point. Uh, but in the moment, definitely does not feel nice. Okay, we've got question number two, four day week. Yes or no? <laughs> well, yeah. And I'm also for a work in the office less than four days a week. I really believe that the flexible way of working, um, at least for me and for many people in our team, is something that opened up, I think, a lot of opportunity for, for moms, for families, for working across different um, regions. We have a lot of projects that are not just in one city that build teams across different regions and locations. And some of my teams that work with teams in in New York said for once um, a zip code isn't your advantage. And so the idea of being able to be more flexible with how you work and where you work um, and trusting that people will do the work um, and then coming together in the right moments is, is really important, but not forced to be working in a way that maybe isn't the best way to work these days. I don't know if four day week is a is a good number. <laughs> it's a number, <laughs> um, but uh, I totally agree with you that there should be more flexibility within each organization for each person that allows to work around whatever their life is and uh, definitely benefits everyone, organization and the individual. Question number three: Which business terms do you use the most at work, if any? <laughs> uh, is it PNL, Tam and Sam? CAC and LTV, REI, AR, PNL, which is a profit and loss. It's a financial statement that you have to look at sometimes as a company. Time and Sam is total addressable market or serviceable, serviceable, service addressable market. Uh, basically, what is the maximum client base you can have as a company as a business? CAC and LTV, customer acquisition costs and lifetime value. So basically, uh, how much does it cost your business to get a certain customer client, whether it's through advertising or anything else? And how much overall that client spends with you as a company, as an agency, or with your product? ROI, return on investment, I suppose the most popular one. Um, AAR, annual accurate revenue. And I, I hope I did it right. <laughs> but basically, um, yeah, how much uh, more money do you make every year? Which ones are the most popular within your work? If I think I'm learning finally what some of these terms actually mean. Um, no, but uh, I think the two that rose to the top one ROI is something you always hear. Um, and that's, you know, ensuring that whatever we're doing 
for with our clients, what they're investing in, that there there's value there for them. But that, you know, that doesn't mean necessarily money value that can be like impact, like what kind of impact are we making? And is there, I like to broaden that out. Like, yes, there's value return on investment. There's a money thing there, but like that could be how people perceive your brand. How are you connecting with people? There's a lot of good things that can come out of looking at ROI through that kind of broader lens. And then I've had to talk a lot about P&Ls as of late because we just reorganized our company um, and we used to be really based on office leadership and we reorganized around um, practices. So uh, people, you know, a group of, of talent leaders around comms versus brand design versus product and experience. And we've had lots of PL discussions. PL makes kind of makes me crazy, but at the same time, I, you know, we get it. We've tried to have fewer of them. We had, I think, 12 to 15 PLs in one in one region, which means a lot of different people that you have to talk to to make decisions around hiring and all those things. Um, so we've recently reduced down to just a few, which makes at least my job easier to get more things done. But the less people have to know that there's a PL and that you're in a PL, the better. It should be like just kind of, you know, as a lens to look to see how the business is doing. But I hope to never have to have people worry or, or utter the term too often. Brilliant. A any other terms that you had to learn when you got to the C level that you were like, what are this? What does it even mean? What are these letters? And then now it's part of your day to day vocabulary. I mean, I hear OIBI a lot, which I still don't actually know what it stands for, but uh, it roughly is like margin. <laughs> so, and sometimes, you know, even in the meetings that I'm in, there's some things that I don't know. Um, I try to learn as many of them. I think the more I understand, the, the better I know how to to get around and you know be able to bring different kinds of solutions to those challenges so it's good that we all learn the terms but it should definitely not be the, fo the the only focus of our conversation the more we talk about how are we supporting and helping clients how do we understand their business how are we you know building teams in the right way um when we focus on those words um and those actions it's much better than all the the marketing terminology that we can be drowned in Oh, I 100% agree. And I also feel like all these terms have been invented by certain people in finance or other departments yeah. just to scare people away. All of them <laughs> are actually pretty simple, as you said. Like, as long as you know the meaning behind is like how much money you make. I specifically like the term business model because uh, I, I like there was explanation recently. It's like basically how you make money. Why people can't talk about simple ways of describing something like how you make money? Instead, they want to create five types of business models or like something that will sound very, very big and, and academic and something like only a certain group of people knows while everyone can relate to how do you make money as a company or as a business and definitely would be much easier to understand for the rest of the organization. But I think it's important for us to be curious and learn new things, but also not to be stuck uh, within the terms and uh, thinking that. That, as you said, that's the only metric that matters or that's the only thing we should focus on. It is all about impact. OK, question number four. Uh, hire for skills and culture will follow or hire for culture fit and skills can be learned. I would say hire for skills. The reason why is I think when you say hire for culture fit, you can get into like some weirdness there. Like what what is that culture fit and whose culture and where are they from? And I think sometimes you say that, but what does that really mean, right? Um, and don't we want people that have had different backgrounds, different cultures to come together, bring different perspectives, or you kind of end up just with one, one type of view on the work. So um, I think skills, and we want people to bring a lot of different types of cultures together. I Though I would say the caveat is probably that depends on what we mean by culture fit and what we discussed before about being open and kind of being um, open for learning and just in general, the way you think can be counted as culture fit. Yeah. But I 100% agree with you that sometimes culture fit becomes this term of, uh, yeah, just looking for someone who's same as you and not exactly. understanding the, the diversity of incredible people that are out there uh, and disregarding them. So uh, skills is a good way to, to focus on that. Okay, question number five. Uh, if you could do any role again for a week, which one would you pick? 
would you want to be again a senior designer, a creative director, or a chief creative officer? <laughs> I'd probably be a senior designer, but I would hope that I um, would all of a sudden be very good at uh, Figma because you know I'm I'm only decent, and a lot of the tools have surpassed me since my um, my my days of being able to do it myself. So I'd have to somehow have s- sort of a, a brain injection <laughs> on how to like use some of the latest tools. But that that would be fun to just focus on one one slice of the role for a day just to see what it's like. And I I pretend to do that occasionally when I help my kids out with their like, um, you know, holiday or uh, birthday parties and uh, and school events where I'll des- design like a very awesome, you know, birthday party card because I'm just hoping to, to be a, a designer or an art director again for a little while. <laughs> I love that you picked designer. And uh, I think, again, going back to our conversation about uh, enjoying every stage of the journey, I think the the further up you get, the more you realize how much fun it was at the step before. But again, it's kind of a good reminder that there will be step after what we're doing now. So we probably should enjoy what we are doing now because 10 years in, we'll be like, ah, remember that time? It was so much fun when we didn't have to think about this and that. Um, so um, yeah, I definitely agree with um, going back and doing doing more stuff there. And, and I think that's actually a very healthy conversation that you don't need to be a chief grade officer to be great at what you do to enjoy your life, to just uh, succeed with all the creative things that you're doing. It's not about the job title for sure. It, it's just a job title that certain people enjoy doing, but doesn't mean everyone should. Oh, someone said, I want to be CCO for good, not just for a week. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a fair comment. It is it's a fair comment. Too. <laughs> um, how do you combine a busy schedule, management tasks and creativity? It's a, it's a relevant question right now because um, I've just been part of this reorganization on how our teams are organized, um, how we look at, you know, do work. And part of that is me figuring out this for this next year, going into this new way of working, new model. How do I make sure I'm I'm scheduling the right amount of times with my teams, looking at work? thought leadership and external activities and my own personal life. And, um, and it gets, when I list them all out, you know, it can be overwhelming and sometimes I get very tactical. So right now I'm, I made a list of like my priorities, um, into buckets with some bullet points underneath them. And I'm actually doing a fake calendar of my first three months of next year on all the meetings and on the ways of uh, sessions that I want to bring teams together. And I'm mapping it out on a week, week by week basis over the course of like a month and looking to see if it's even possible because everything I've listed that I need to do and want to do, I'm going to realize I can't do. And so what I'm doing is putting it all on there and just seeing how, oh, I would actually have to work all night and all weekend to get that done. And then I have to reprioritize and go, okay, well, if I can't do this weekly, could I do it monthly? And if I can't take this on, who on my team can take this part on? And do I have to say no to judging this award show or doing this? Which management meetings do I have to step out of? Um, and you know, and where am I going to prioritize my time with events for family, vacations, things like that? So sometimes it's actually as literal as like making the calendar, color coding it, and then just looking to see if it's even humanly possible. And then you have to make some hard choices on what you have to say no to. Um, it's something we do with with clients and brands. There's a framework of stop, start, continue. Um, you know, what are the things you're going to stop doing? The only way you, if you stop things, can you start doing the new things? And then what are the things that you're going to kind of continue to do that you've always done? And finding the the balance of those and the priorities of those is is really important, but it, it can be a lot if you just try to do it all, which is often what I'm I try to do, and and then things start to to fall off off the list, and you don't you want to be in charge of what those things are and deciding them versus it happening because you're out of control basically. Oh, 100% agree that uh, sometimes when you realize how much you planned. For the next month or few months, you realize that you need to have a double to complete even half of the things. So it's good to reprioritize and actually see what 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 you can drop. What's your current, I suppose, ratio between creative work, team management, ops, um, and other things that you want to do that will 
all cool, but maybe no core. <laughs> I probably, at least in work, when you be become CCO, um, you have sort of the, the way that I think about involving myself with work is there's some work that I kind of go deep on and there's some work that I go wide on. The wide work is more, I'm helping to make sure we have the, like the, we can hire the best. We have the right people in place and bringing in the right talent and then looking at briefs and things like that, that are going to shape the work and make the most impact on everyone else that does their job. I can't be in the weeds looking at every single review, but I can actually create some conditions and ways of working and the right talent to make sure that the work gets to the place it needs to be. And then I usually pick a couple of key clients that tend to, as a CCO, you tend to be the ones that are your biggest, most challenging clients, ones that you have the relationship with. And those um, I go deep on. And often I'm picking the clients that are sometimes the most challenging that that others are like having the hardest time with um, cut, cut to the fireproofing, firefighting comment. Um, and there I go deep and I, I'm, you know, understanding all the work I'm reviewing it. Um, I'm helping to make sure that I'm almost like the exec sponsor of some of those clients and those I'm, I'm accountable to that the creative work, the relationships are great. And, and I see work down, you know, to the everyday presentation. So I stay somewhat close to a couple of key clients and then have a light touch on a lot of work. All the work is, is, is my, you know, how I have to do that. And I also do that through the lens of, um, I do these things called GR8 councils. We have a, a, a tool it's called GR8. It's four questions around the concepts themselves and four questions on the, the impact of the results. And we meet twice a year as a council across disciplines to look at all work in progress. That is the, you know, kind of rising to the top as well as work that's all launched. And that's a tool they use throughout the year. So that gives me that wide view. So that I would say is probably about um, 40 to 50, maybe 50% of if it has some sort of direct impact. And then I would say um, 30%, 25 to 30% is internal, like management, making choices around business needs, um, you know, all of the exec meetings, broader management type meetings. Um, and then the rest is um, kind of external thought leadership, board shows, um, things like that. Oh, this was super helpful. Thank you so much for talking about all the different things that you look after. And I especially love this thinking about what impact your work makes and kind of constantly reflecting back at your work. I think that's a, a very great way to uh, to check in with yourself. Um, and how do you see AI impacting our creative work at every level? I, I think it's going to hugely impact um, our work. And I've seen, you know, amazing tools that our teams have already started to use both from the visual kind of generative side, the, the verbal generative side. Um, like we've always had tools and technology, I think, to support the creative work, but what's happening now is like kind of almost beyond imagination in terms of what it's able to do. And I think our roles are going to shift there. Our roles have always shifted. I saw when I, I ran um, YouTube maybe 15 years ago, right when it was first getting going and it was the YouTube creators and understanding what a creator was and this different kind of creative role that was also a community leader and they a business as well as a creative, uh, an influencer, all of these things. And that was a way of changing it. Things like Photoshop and, um, you know, a different uh, keynote, all these different types of tools have always helped um, enable our creativity. But I think this probably more than anything. Um, and I think we'll have to, our roles will still, will still need skills to, I think, understand a lot of it's going to be skill set by understanding what great craft is, um, what taste is, how to, how to be a curator. Also, Ref, just as we've always referenced good work as part of our work, we used to pull mood boards up, you know, to, to find, or there's a style that you want to like be inspired by. Like we've always kind of pulled that reference, but I think AI is just taking that to another level where the inputs that you put in is going to be based on what you get out. So you still need to know the things to put in because it's all going to be about how we prompt it, how we curate the stuff that is generated because we need to be choiceful. So the idea of more of a creative director is even more important because you really have to think about how you're bringing those things together. 
Um, and I think we just have to be okay with that. Our, our role is, is changing to a certain degree. And then I do think there's a lot of legality that's still unknown about it. Like, and if anything, humans in the equation are, are what's going to allow some of these things to be put out in the world too, because there has to be that human lens that enables it to actually be put into the market. So we still have a role, role to do. Um, and uh, it's just going to be open to us being a different kind of creative person than probably we were before. Oh, 100% agree about curation and create creative process behind the actual output that is still not going anywhere for sure. Gregoria is asking, how do you understand if you want to be a design leader and what's the best path to get there? Um, I mean, working as a designer, <laughs> like if you haven't, I don't know what, what level people are at, but I went to design school. I went to art center um, in Pasadena. I, I interestingly started as a designer without school. And that was early days of web. No one really knew what uh, how to do website design and programming. Then I even tried to go to school for it and there wasn't. So I was kind of initially self-taught, but there was definitely something to be said to going to design school and having the space to, to just be a student, to learn, to do printmaking, as well as digital design, to design a book, as well as an ad, to um, create products uh, and design you know, is there's a lot, design is a, a big word too. There's a lot of different types of design. There's experience design, there's even verbal design. Um, and so I think it's exploring. And, and a lot of times it's hard to know what kind of design you're going to be guided by. And, and, and you want to have as much kind of a, that experience to help shape the kind of designer that you, you can be and want to be. And how do you know that you want to be specifically a leader, not just stay an individual contributor and a designer? So let's say you are amazing at the craft and already done all of this. How do you know you actually built and need to progress as a leader, not just stay at the creative path? Yeah, I mean, I think there's more and more openness to that. It almost felt like there was one path where it's like the only way you move to the next level is if it's about managing. I think, you know, there are there are roles, more roles being shaped out that are a bit more from that craft perspective. Like even in our new shape of our organization, we have um, what we call practice leads that are a bit more on the, the managing a certain type of craft as a whole that is multidisciplinary. But we also have craft leads that are specific to a certain kind of design, a certain kind of writing. And their job is a bit more to look at that, how to develop the skill set within that craft and also the people and the talent. So the people version versus the, the the combination of multiple disciplines together and what the work output is as a whole and how to sell that to clients and and, and shape a, a certain kind of point of view. There are going to be people that want to manage and like to teach and build and grow. Um, there's other ones that want to understand that kind of business side of it, um, understanding how to sh shape and sell work for clients through a different lens. And some that are just going to be like, I want to be an expert in this one area and shape and build and, and just do a certain kind of work. And that's all that I'm passionate about. And I think there's so much content, so much design that's needed in the world to be done that I do think there's a lot of different um, versions of, of design and design lead that, that people can choose from. And, you know, you have to kind of help figure out your, for yourself what the right pathway is. And it might not be running an office then, or maybe it isn't as maybe they don't make quite the same or whatever it is, but you'll be more happy doing a certain kind of role. And I think that's just for each person to kind of shape and decide for themselves. That's a fantastic answer because you pointed specifically very two important things. One is leadership is not always about managing people. You can lead and inspire people in all sorts of ways. And I think as a creative, that's what we have power to do. And also it's all about listening to yourself, whether you want to take certain career path or not. And I think listening more to what you enjoy and what you want to do instead of what I don't know, the traditional path. So I think it's so, so, so important. I actually have one last question for you, which is a bit more philosophical that we ask at the end of each conversation, which is if you could change one thing in the world, what would it be? Well, I just saw the question around um, sustainability. That's a good one to end on. I'll, I'll agree with that. I think us being better focused um, around how we are going to ensure that our world is still here for future generations and um and not just you know in the moment 
whatever works in our, you know, every day is whatever's convenient. How, how can we des as designers ensure for that? Cause we, we owe it, we owe it to, you know, our kids, we owe it to the next um, generations of future designers that we are, you know, in, in a place where we can thrive and live and breathe. And so I think that's a, that's a pretty good one. And that's, you know, just a refocus around, around our world. That's a fantastic way to finish our conversation, thinking about the future, thinking about the future of the future generation, and definitely as creators, we all this to the planet to think about what is the impact of everything that they, we put on there, how does it affect cultures, environments, and everything else, uh, every single thing that we create. Um, well, thank you so, so much, thank Tiffany, you. for your time. Thank you. Happy holidays, everyone. Bye.